that works. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, you, you can see, I uh, look like I'm in a tropical place here. I'm actually at the Ramada in Sioux Falls, um, spending the day here because I had some late meetings last night. I had a basketball practice this morning, uh, some meetings today, and then a basketball practice right away at uh, six o'clock tomorrow morning. So I'm spending the day here. Um, I will tell you this, I'm down here because I thought uh, the internet would be better. It looks like it is, but it also is about 125 degrees right here where I am. So if I start sweating, you know why. Um, but excited uh, to, to be on here again today. We had a great show last night again on Mick Mondays with Mick Gary. Um, it was, you know, obviously it's Giving Tuesday today and it's a huge day for Higher Power Sports. Um, and it was a fun conversation. I got to talk about Higher Power Sports and what we do. And um, it's hard for me to talk about because it seems like I'm talking about myself a lot of times, but uh, we, we do so many things and, and we can't do it without the support of everybody. And I appreciate that. So and let's get right into my, uh, my guest today. Uh, you know, I, I got to tell you this. A couple things before we get to, to you. Um, a lot of the people that I've had on here, I've met before. And a lot of them are my friends or, um, you know, basketball coaches that I know. And they all got one name. It's Coach. It's Bush. <laughs> it's Buck. It's George. <laughs> but you're, you're the first person I've had on here. Two things. That has goes by middle initial. So Nicole J. Phillips. So, you know, you're pretty, I mean, that's, now I'm nervous, you know, right, like right. saying, Hey, Buck, Hey, Joe, you know, <laughs> old J. Phillips joins us. And the other thing is you've got a team that works with you. I, I talked to you uh, via messages and then I, I had a, a team member. So, I mean, you're a big deal here. Oh, totally. Totally a big deal. Yeah. Yeah. Um, by the way, like my entire team calls me Nick. So you can call me Nick. Like they don't ever call me Nicole unless they're talking about me to somebody else. And the only reason why I am Nicole J. Phillips is because when I initially started writing, now this is like 10 years ago, I was looking up, uh, I don't know if it was, I don't even know if we had Facebook, if it was Facebook or just some website or whatever it was, but I was looking, I Googled Nicole Phillips Nikki Phillips, you know, all of that. And everyone was taken. I was taken my name all over the world, you know? And so I had to go Nicole J. Phillips so that hopefully at some point somebody could find me to talk about kindness. So yeah, no, it's, uh, it's, it's all smoke and mirrors. Uh, and, um, in, and it's all by the grace of God, because I'll tell you what, like I was totally snowed in doing what I do four years ago, three years ago. And I just was like, okay, God, if I am meant to continue to talk about kindness, which I believe I am, then you got to help me because like, uncle, I give up. I cannot do this on my own. And then I had these three amazing women who just kind of popped out of the woodwork and said, I want to help you. I want to help you. I want to help you. I was like, great. You can help me for free. Be my guest. <laughs> And we all need help. That's for, that's for sure. But, you know, let's, let's take a step back and, you know, let's get, you know, again, your people, you know, sent me this long bio, uh, you know, very impressive. Uh, but let's hear it from you. You know what, uh, you know, who is Nick? This is, this is the bio. And then because I'm a coach, basketball coach's wife, woo. <laughs> and I missed, which is why I'm not on the team. Like, take the bio, throw it out the window. Here's the exciting thing you need to know. I won a car in The Price is Right last year. Um, I was on House Hunters last year. Can you tell I had a midlife crisis last year? Um, uh, I, I love, my favorite place in the whole wide world is to be uh, on the set of Home and Family on the Hallmark Channel. So I get to do that, you know, three, four times a year. I've written a couple of books about kindness. I write a newspaper column about kindness that runs in North Dakota, Minnesota, and South Dakota. And I have a show called The Kindness Podcast. And it's just, you know, that's the work part of me. And then, then the other part is the, uh, I'm a mom of three. 
I am uh, the wife of a college basketball coach. My husband, Saul, used to coach at NDSU, took uh, the NDSU Bison basketball team, the men's team to the NCAA tournament a couple of times, and that was fun. Then we went to Ohio University, and now we are at uh, Northern State University in Aberdeen, South Dakota. So there's all of that, Tim. And then there's the like, okay, now let's peel back that onion a little bit more and see what's behind this chick. Uh, and the, the truth of the matter is I stumbled into everything I do because 10 years ago I was an alcoholic. And so I was a drinker and a smoker and an overeater. I was angry at my husband all the time. I mean, just really frustrated with the fact that I was home raising a couple of babies and, and he was out, you know, eating steak dinners with the team. Like, not cool, man. Staying in the Ramada, I mean, like I look at you there and I'm like, oh, he gets to stay in the Ramada. <laughs> That's my jam. I love it. Absolutely. And yeah. you you mentioned, let's let's talk about your husband real quick. You know, being a coach's wife and, and that struggle, you know, there's so many coaches that watch this and families that, you know, I've been a coach for a lot of years, you know, maybe talk about that real quick uh, before we get into the kindness and, and you know, how we, I kind of, figured out, hey, this is somebody that kind of thinks like me, maybe. Yeah, yeah. Well, and I think that that as a coach, I, I can't say for the coach, because I know there's a, a unique kind of stress that you go through, that even as a wife, I can't, I just can't put my finger on it. I just can't relate to. But what I can say from being the wife of a coach is that a lot of times I feel invisible. You know, I don't, uh, I don't know if other marriages this happens, but I don't, my husband doesn't come home and say, oh, you look so pretty today. Like, what did you do? You know, like, no, he's like, oh my gosh, like so-and-so is going to transfer and oh, so-and-so had an amazing practice. And, um, and when the season begins, my husband, you know, you can kind of see his eyes go into game mode. There's just a shift. It was weird, subtle shift where he's almost looking through me. And I know it's coming. I know that we're in the beginning of the season because he will put the milk in the cover and the Cheerios in the refrigerator. Like it's just this weird thing. And then, you know, he goes on a non COVID year, he would go away for the whole season, right? Basically you pop in and out and, but for the most part, like it's my job to hold down the fort. I can assume he's going to be gone and if I want to also be gone, then, which I do for a living, that's what I do. I travel around and speak. Then, you know, it's up to me to make sure that I've got a, a babysitter covered, that I've got, you know, the pet taken care of, that all of those, those things are met uh, so that he can focus on doing what he does. He comes back after the season's over. And, you know, I've got everything working like clockwork because I am like, I am a person who I'm going to get it done. Right. I'm an independent woman. And so then he comes back in and, and I'm like, wait, no, 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 no. It's bedtime right now. It is not time to play football outside with the kids time. Like, you know, um, so we've, we've definitely, we've been married for 20 years and our kids are now, let's see, I've got a daughter who's a junior in high school, a son who's a freshman in high school and the littlest one is 10 he's a fifth grader and so we've kind of gotten past the little kid age um and we've just learned how to communicate with each other we know the cycles our marriage is going to go through and i think really we've just both grown and matured enough to understand what it means to give grace you know yeah and figuring that out it it doesn't come easy you know, it's, it's trial and error. It's, you know, it's, it's, you know, again, learning the other person, even though they're not coming home and saying, Oh, you look great. They still love you and respect you and all that. But it, it's tough sometimes when you're going through a hard time, whether it's through a basketball season or a difficult time in your life to, to see those moments. So it's gotta be nice that you've been able to kind of you know, kind of forge through some difficulties, you know, the wins and losses of a basketball season, the, the good seasons and the not so good seasons right. and to end up where you're at. Right, right. And to be together in it still, we really consider that to be really valuable. And I, I look at it as being really valuable because I know that it, there's an alternative, you know, and, and my parents uh, were divorced when I grew up. 
Saul's parents were not. Um, he's a very traditional family and I did not. And so my mom ended up, um, she married a prison inmate when I was in about fourth grade. And so I would go to the prison with her and, and visit this man. And I was the flower girl in my mom's prison chapel wedding, like all these weird sorts of things that were very different from the way Saul grew up. But one of the things that we knew from the beginning was that we were going to take the word divorce off the table and we were just going to to try our hardest for better or worse to figure it out. And so, you know, 10 years ago when I'm I am drinking and I'm angry and I just, you know, I'm, I'm in this pattern of really being unhealthy, I could see what was at jeopardy. I knew what could happen if a change didn't take place. And yet I had no idea how to create that change in my life. I was just miserable. Um, and that's when I found kindness through just a, a random act of kindness that ended up uh, for me turning into a newspaper column and then books and a speaking career and all of this stuff because my life changed so dramatically when I began being intentional about kindness. Yeah, and that gets to the point how I, you know, I. I know Coach Saul, and you know. Then I started following you on social media, and kindness is contagious. I use that in my, uh, you know, for the last six years, I've been using that. In, in, and then I, well, she's stealing my stuff. No. <laughs> <laughs> We're the same person. You're just the boy version of me. It's awesome. <laughs> you think alike, I guess. Yes. You talked about that. You know how it was an act of kindness that you know, kind of jump started this, you know, basically a new career for you. Um, and, uh, you know, that has helped in a lot of your, you know, your life, you know, as well. But, you know, when you, when you say kindness is contagious, what does that mean to you? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, it means a couple of things because, you know, there's, we talk about the ripple effect. Like if I do an act of kindness for you, you feel good. You might want to go and maybe you go home and you're nicer to your kid or, you know, you decide, oh, I'm going to stop and buy flowers for my wife or whatever. And it can ripple like that. Right. But for me, I really feel like the, the life we transform with kindness is our own. So kindness, as it becomes contagious, kicks back to us. So I might ha be having a really bad day. And I might say, you know what? I know that I'm in this funk. I know I don't want to be there. I've got to get my eyes off my own pity party. So I'm going to put my eyes on the needs of Tim. And, you know, I know, let's say, I know Tim's out of town and his wife's really busy. So I'm going to take them a rotisserie chicken for dinner, right? And so I do that. I hope it makes you feel better. I hope it makes you feel good. But the fact of the matter is when I get back in my car and drive home, I'm the one who feels different for sure. I'm the one who stepped out of my comfort zone. I'm the one who, who got my eyes off of myself and my day was rerouted. And so the kindness you put out comes back to you. It's very contagious. It goes back and forth. Yeah, and uh, my story on that is kind of similar because I received a letter from a, a kid that I graduated with and uh, you know, he had, had health issues throughout and, you know, was kind of one of those kids that I talk about. He sat at a different table at the lunchroom than I did. You know, I sat with all the jocks and all that. And I got this letter from him and I didn't, I read it and I didn't talk about it for five years because what could have that letter, you know, when you think about it and I talk to these kids, you know, imagine what that letter could say. Luckily it said, he thanked me for being kind and, you know, to be completely honest, I mean, I, I knew I was kind of, you know, had his back once in a while, but I didn't know the impact that it had. But the most important thing is for me is that letter made me feel good. And now every time I get to talk about it, it makes me feel good because like you said, now you're willing to help more people because I, Hey, I I'm getting something out of this too. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I'm sure you already know this, but for the people that are listening, you know, we talk about the, the four feel good chemicals that are released into the body during an act of kindness. And it's not just for the receiver or it's not just for the giver, but it's the giver, the receiver and the witness. We all have these. So like, I've got these great feel good chemicals because you just shared this story about this letter. Like my whole body's going, Oh, you know? Um, and it, so it matters. It matters. It's continually cycling. 
and and you've used this to you, you mentioned the the newspaper uh column uh you know you've written a couple books maybe talk about you know your writing and you know how that came about and the projects that you've worked on Mm -hmm. So the writing came about because I got a call from the publisher of the newspaper in Fargo, North Dakota. That's where we were living at the time. And he said, I know that you used to be a TV anchor and we are starting a, a new segment. We're looking for female writers. Because of your TV background, would you be willing to write about politics? And so <laughs> I was like, no, no way. Um, and then he asked, would you write about cooking? And I said, well, I have made lasagna twice and both times forgot to put in the lasagna noodles. Um, I may have been drinking, but we're not going to be judgmental, right? Like, uh, and then, you know, he said, do you want to write about parenting? And I said, sure, I'll write about parenting as soon as I have launched these three small children from my home and I know that I can do it successfully. So he kind of threw his hands in the air and he said, when you figure out what you want to write about, you call me. And um, I had an interaction with a young mom and it was very brief, it was quick and um, really didn't stick with her, but it stuck with me. Um, and so I, I had given her enough money to fill up her car with gas and take her kid to McDonald's a few times. But I got back into my car with this high, unlike anything I had ever experienced before, because I talked to someone out of my comfort zone. I, tr I, I got my eyes off of myself. I tried to see the world through her eyes and it just, it just lit me up inside more than any of the self-medicating things I had tried to do before. And I just thought if everyone knew what this felt like, kindness would be contagious because everyone would want to try it. And so I, I ended up going home and writing down that story. And I sent it to the publisher of the newspaper. And I said, this is what I want to write about. I want to write about kindness. And I want people to send in their stories of things they've done and how it made them feel. And I want people to send in stories of those times when kindness showed up for them just when they needed it, because I feel like there's more out there than we're giving credit for. And the publisher said, sure. They gave me a weekly column. They called it Kindness is Contagious. And you might appreciate this. Saul, um, who has seen many versions of his wife, many unkind versions of his wife, uh, he said, I, he said I, I give it six months. And I said, what? And he said, within six months, you're either going to realize no one will send you any stories of kindness or you're just going to be bored writing about it. Like it's going to be the same cat got stuck in the tree thing over and over again. Um, well, I am competitive, much like my husband. And so I always like to prove him wrong when it ever possible. And so I have, I started writing it in 2011 and we still, I still write it every week. People still send in their stories of kindness. I have the happiest email inbox ever. And, um, but within that first year of being intentional about it, you know, I stopped, I totally stopped drinking, quit smoking, lost 30 pounds, re-fell in love with my husband, who it turns out is a really great guy, even though he can never make the laundry hamper when he shoots his socks, you know, he's still a great guy. And I thought, you know, I wonder if it's just me or if people were more intentional about kindness every day if it would create these drastic changes in their lives. And so I took a hundred of the stories from that newspaper column and I put them together in a book and I called it Kindness is Contagious, the book. And then, and that went off well, people seem to enjoy being able to read those, you know, it's like keep it in your bathroom and you know, it takes you three minutes to read a story or when you have a, you know, keep it in your car, when you've got a bad day, it, you can just stop, read a story, kind of reroute your brain. And um, so they said, can you write some more <laughs> and put them in a book? Like, apparently, you know, the newspapers, you know, it only comes once a week. So, uh, or at least my column. So I took a hundred more stories, put them into another book called Kindness is Courageous. 100 stories to remind you people are brave and kind. And then I just felt this overwhelming need 
to basically write a how-to guide. How do you go from living life to loving life? What are the practical applications? What do you have to say to yourself? What has to happen in your mind and in your thoughts and then in your actions to go from point A to point B? And so that book is called The Negativity Remedy. And then that one was released in September of this year. Awesome. Let me ask you, you know, I go out and I talk on kindness and all that, but oftentimes right before, you know, you got that, why am I doing this? Why, you know, people, why are they going to believe me or what have I done? Or, you know, I, I'm not worthy of talking about this, you know, writing all these stories and, and the books and doing your speaking, you know, you ever get that feeling that uh, nobody's going to want to listen to me and, and, you know, am I really living this out? Yeah. Oh, totally. I actually went to therapy for like six months to answer that question. <laughs> And the therapist was like, okay, you have what we like to refer to as the imposter syndrome, which is, you know, you, you feel like there's gotta be somebody better than me to tell this story. Um, and when I felt like I was doing it on my own and in my own, on my own accord, I, I could say there's somebody better out there to tell the story. I still know that there is someone who knows more than I do. There is someone with a more compelling, heartbreaking story than me, you know? Yes. But you know, there's only one Tim and there's only one Nicole. And so, you know, you talked about this team that I have, the team loves numbers. They love, they love to see how many Facebook followers we have and how many people listen to the podcast. I could care less about numbers. And I had to do that intentionally, Tim, because for me, if there is one person who hears something I say and it changes the climate of their home or it changes the space they live in in their mind, then it was worth it for the one person. I would do it all over again. And, and then, it, then it doesn't matter, you know, if it was if I'm the perfect person to do it or not, it doesn't matter. And I can stand in the bathroom before I go and speak, whether it's to a Christian crowd or a secular crowd, I can stand in the bathroom and I can say, thank you, God, that you are allowing me to be here today to do this. Absolutely. You know, as you were talking there, my mind went to, you know, that not only for people like us getting up in front of people or, you know, saying things that, you know, we, we're, coaches, uh, business people, you know, all those people that struggle through, uh, am I good enough? Can I, can I make enough sales to reach my quota? Um, you know, can I win enough games to keep my job? Can I recruit well enough? Um, you know, do I know an offense or a defense to stop the other team? All those things, uh, you know, it, it's not just about one type of person. It's, it's about all of us, really. Yeah, it is. It is about everybody doing what they do to the best of their ability to do it and just to lend a helping hand along the way. You know, I mean, there are times I think that conversations I'll have with Saul about something I'm going through that I think like he doesn't get it. Like he doesn't understand what it feels like to be depressed or he doesn't understand what anxiety feels like to me. And then he, he will have, not two days later, a player walk into his office and say something about something I had. And he gets to be the rock for that person, like he was for me. And it was almost like it was a test drive with me. And then with the younger guys, you know, when they really need a solid mentor, he's ready for that. And so, yeah, it's, there are so many aspects to what people do that to be one dimensional and say, I've got to make sure I don't lose my job. Well, you know what? Guess what? Saul lost his job at Ohio. You know what? We landed on our feet. We are in Aberdeen and we're, we're happy. It's a great, great place for us to be. Um, so sometimes the worst case scenario isn't really the worst case scenario either. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, the term always this, the saying, you know, some, somebody's going through something maybe worse than you have or different than you have or that you don't know about. And as I was driving to O'Gorma this morning um, in a car that is donated to me, mm. that needs gas. I drove by 
people waiting on bus stops, people that had garbage bags. So, you know, going through those things, it just makes you stronger and stronger. Apologize. <laughs> I, I love the authenticity. I love that you can look at that and feel that because how many people wake up in the morning and say, yes, I breathe today. You know, how many people woke up in their bed and said, yes, I did not wake up in the hospital bed. You know, how many people pick up their briefcase and say, woo, I have a job today. Like you turn on the water, like, yes, running water. This is awesome. And so I think you telling us that is a really great reminder to see it, to just pay attention. There's a, a guy that I love named Don Carter, and he's a friend of mine. And um, Don said, you know, Nick, people are so worried when it comes to kindness about paying it back. Like, oh, I got to give it back or paying it forward. Somebody bought me kindness. I've got to, or bought me coffee. I've got to pay it forward. He goes, you know what? Just pay attention. That's all you got to pay. And so it's beautiful. Absolutely. Now, if, uh, you know, this is the 20 to 30 minutes that I told you about, we're rolling right through this. So let's talk about, you know, if somebody wanted to, you know, get a hold of you or your book or, or read your column, you know, I know you're on social media, but where would they, you know, find you um, to, to maybe purchase the book? Um, the books are uh, on Amazon or wherever you buy books. I think actually the Barnes and Noble in Sioux Falls has them. Like it's, they're, they're, they're all over the place right now. Um, so as far as getting the books, that's the best avenue for that. But if somebody wants to talk about something or share a kindness story or says, hey, I always wanted to write a book. How do you do that? Or, you know, I would love for you to come and speak to our group. Um, then my website is nicolejphillips.com and, you know, cause I got to have all three names and then, uh, the, the email is info at nicolejphillips.com. Um, uh, so either of those things. All right. Um, as I, I'll wrap up a couple things here and then I'll turn it over to you for any last words, um, for everybody out there that, you know, might be going through a hard time, you know? through the pandemic or, uh, you know, just might be struggling with something. But first of all, I just want to say thanks um, to everybody that always watches this. Again, it's Giving Tuesday, a huge day for higher power sports. So, um, you know, if you're thinking about helping somebody out, we really appreciate it. Uh, you know, I got to talk a lot about higher power sports yesterday when I um, had this with Mick, Mondays with Mick, and uh, Mick is a great supporter of mine. And uh, so many, I can't do it, you know, that, Higher power, like I said yesterday, higher power sports is me, and that's not bragging. That's just that's how much your help means because um, we we rely on all those uh, five dollar, ten dollar donations to keep us on the road and keep gas in the car and, and things like that. So uh, appreciate everything everybody does for me, uh, Nicole J. Phillips. Uh, you know, I, I, again, I appreciate your time. And uh, really like your work, and have really enjoyed getting to you know know you through social media. And I hope uh, you know we can continue to 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 get to know each other and see you know how how kindness can even be more contagious. So, uh, any last words for uh, our audience or anything you'd like to share? Sure. One one story I talk about in uh, the negativity remedy book is. Um, about a professor and the professor had an assembly hall full of students and he held up a piece of paper and it was a white piece of paper and in the middle was a black dot. And he said, I just want you to jot about what, you, what you're seeing right now. The kids took a moment, they, they wrote some things down, the professor collected all the papers and he started reading them one after another after another. And some people would say, you know, I see a black dot. Some people would say, oh, I see a navy circle. Some people would say, I see a hole into an alternate universe. And some people would say, I see a black hole. I mean, you know, all kinds of simple things to creative things. But the one point that was made was that every single one of those students talked about the black dot. What else was on the page? The white space. And so all of us, have black dots in our lives. It might be a quarantine. It might be a diagnosis. It might be financial. It might be, um, you know, a divorce or a fight or whatever, whatever it is, a death. 
there is nothing that you can say, Tim, or I can say to erase those black dots for people. There's just nothing. But I think what we both like to do is point out for people the white space, because the white space is the place where kindness lives. It's where holding a hand lives or a great hug or a delicious meal or the sunshine or, you know, hot running water. It's all of those things. And so if you're willing, you know, like, like you said, like being able to drive a car to where you need to go, like that's a white space. And so our vision will focus in on whatever we're looking at. So if we're looking at the black dots, we're going to see them. But if we can open up our vision enough to look for the white space, uh, our our vision will will be able to pick up on that sooner and it'll really change our mindset. So that's the final thought I wanted to leave people with. That's awesome. Again, uh, thank you for your time. Good luck with the book and, and, and continued success with the article. Um, and obviously, good luck to the Northern State Wolves, you know, as they what, begin to, you know, again, everything's pushed back a little bit for them, but, yeah. Yeah. you know, uh, Best of luck to them. And uh, I've met your husband a couple of times at some recruiting things and he's hilarious. I And uh, just really enjoyed my time uh, sitting next to him at a couple of those. So again, thank you for your time and we will talk to you soon. Thank you. Thanks, Tim. Good luck to O'Gorman too. Thank you.